Good after afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar on physical activity and sports participation with a focus on lower socioeconomic audiences. Never before have inequalities in society been so visible. All the practicalities and the uh, benefits of physical activity being so widely known. So what can you do to ensure that the opportunities that you provide in communities are both reaching and accessible to people who would benefit from them the most? Today's guests share their insights and experiences, evidence and really practical examples of some of the great work they're doing in communities. Communities like you may well work in too. They'll seek to challenge you and your organisations to rethink how you do things to ensure that people in communities can truly access affordable, local and engaging opportunities to help them lead fulfilling and healthy lives. Now, for those that are joining us, my name is Yvonne Harrison um, and um, I'm the chair for today. I'm going to take you through today's proceedings. If you haven't been on a Y Sports webinar before, just to let you know, they're really interactive. So you'll see a really simple chat function that you can use to post comments and also pose questions to our panellists throughout the conversation. We'll also be asking for your opinions on our interactive polls, so feel free to give us those. And just so you know, all the slides will be shared um, post-webinar, so you'll be able to have access to the resources that we go through today. Now, you can engage via our social media channels too. Um, we are on at Y Sports Media, and we're also using a hashtag, which is LSEG21, today so please feel free to tell the world what you're hearing with some really fantastic insights now without further ado we're going to get into today's presentations firstly i'd like to introduce to you rachel graham who is head of low socioeconomic groups and warren lee who is strategic lead for london in the local delivery directorate both from sport england so they're going to be sharing the latest insights from sport england around engagement with lower socioeconomic audiences and also working in places with communities to tackle inequalities. Rachel and Warren, over to you. Thanks, Yvonne, and thanks very much for having us at this Y Sports webinar today. Um, our little double act of myself and Warren is to leave you with some thoughts about the low socioeconomic audience um, and the link with place and communities. As I'm sure you'll know, we have a new strategy uniting the movement and what we wanted to share today is some of our learning from the past few years, which alongside the consultation we have conducted has helped shape this new strategy. We are on a journey with this work, it's not perfect and we are by no means experts. So today, in our time today, um, we are going to give you a very whistle-stop whistle tour of our work I'm going to focus on the audience um, and some insight that's helped us gain em empathy and consider working in a different way rather than simply grouping up rather a large section of the population. Warren's going to follow by talking about working in place and the importance of the community within that work. We'd like to pose some questions for you to think about for yourself as you're listening and perhaps share some of your experiences and insight within the chat. These questions are on the slide, but you can also see them in the chat too. So low socioeconomic audiences. Pre the pandemic, Sport England commissioned a review into all its work around low socioeconomic groups and audiences. We wanted to know what we'd learnt and where were our gaps. Two organisations, Craft and Outsiders, both with experience of working in low economic communities from both a research and practical angle conducted the review. This review was completed in May 2020. It highlighted some challenges about our work with this particular audience. These challenges were to help us in the pursuit of reducing inequalities in sport and physical activity. So what's the current picture? At the time of the review, 54% of adults from lower socioeconomic groups were active. It's now 52%, so we've had a drop of 2%. That's about 250,000 adults doing less than pre-pandemic. The overall population of adults 61.4% of them are active. That's 700,000 fewer than the last year. Low socioeconomic groups are more reliant on walking for travel, and I don't suspect that's any surprise to anyone. And as such, the large drops here have had a greatest impact overall with people staying in and not going to work or going out much over the last year. 
No social groups have tried to remain active. Home activity has significantly increased over the last year in comparison to the previous year. However, because of the large decreases in activity at built environments and the outdoors, it hasn't significantly impacted on the levels of participation. Whilst levels of activity fell across all socioeconomic groups in the last year, the gap between lower and higher social groups has widened during this period, which I don't suspect is of any surprise to anyone. But when we talk about these drops in activity and the amount of people who are active within the low socioeconomic group, it's important that we remember that we're talking about 12 million people within this low socioeconomic grouping, NSX six to eight. That's a lot of people to think about in one go. Is it really possible to consider tackling this gap at this large macro level? You can see it's a complicated picture. It's very hard to think of low socioeconomic group as one whole group. For a start, there's intersectionality between ethnicity, gender, disability and age. A few things are not on the slide. Levels of disposable income across the, NS, across the NSF groups show us that not all low income individuals are in poverty. A significant number of working age C2DEs are in employment. But how this, this picture may well have changed over the last year and through the pandemic. The reality is that 12 million population, most of them inhabit the middle. The families and individuals who are not known to us or other organisations. They're not known because they don't fall into any groupings that we might look for. Unemployed, job seeking, at risk of offending, NEETs or children on free school meals. I'm going to give you a few seconds to look through that slide, but I'm sure that we all know this. It's a complicated issue. It's not a small challenge and there isn't a silver bullet solution. Warren will pick up again on this later when talking about place and communities. This is complex and Sport England can't tackle the inequality of activity alone. We need to do it in partnership. So some thinking for you, when you think about the low socioeconomic, when you think about low socioeconomic individuals, what images come to mind? What do you see? Take a moment to think and if you want to pop something in the chat about what you think about. There's no right or wrong to this answer either. Is this something that you envisage when you think about low socioeconomic audiences? There's nothing wrong with this, but perhaps these images are ones that create a misconception of low socioeconomic audiences. Perhaps the media provides us with some of this unconscious bias. I grew up in social housing with parents on limited income. Things weren't always easy and I wasn't able to do all the activities as I wanted to because we couldn't afford them. I remember my mum and dad mending things um, and making things that we couldn't afford. I remember having to run by the, swim, the desk at swimming club, embarrassed because we owed the subs and mum didn't have the money that month. But overall, we were an active family. We just did it in different ways that didn't impact on our income. This personal experience of mine doesn't stop me from having an unconscious bias. And even within this presentation, I apologise because I know I may well slip into talking about them and creating an unconscious divide. Removing unconscious bias is something for important for us all to consider. And the review that we conducted suggested that we would never fully tackle inequality without removing it. And that's a bold challenge. The review highlighted several conceptual issues that are usually well-meaning meaning unconscious biases. And these are the six that it concentrated on. Imagining a group of 12 million people as a homogenous whole. There is little understanding of the experiences within this broad group, nor of the intersectionality I mentioned previously. Treating the whole as a totally other and different to other socio-economic groups and by definition inactive. Over half of the low socioeconomic individuals are active and we know nothing about these individuals. We don't know what their motivations to be active are and whether they are any different to an individual to someone from a higher economic group. We've never asked that question. Framing the issue of lower levels of um, activity among LSEGs as being caused just by their socioeconomic status, the poverty lens, to the exclusion of any other factors. 
There's a tendency to assume that the entire group leads a precarious existence mired in poverty, facing complex compound issues. This in turn leads to a focus at at-risk individuals, to the exclusion of the middle population and to the assumptions that these individuals are hard to reach and that the issues are some way intractable. And we see, tend to see this ALSEG population as a problem to be solved rather than agents of their own change and therefore seek a solution um, rather than co-create. One of the conceptual issues can also lead to other issues. And there are many ways of defining and measuring who is in a low socioeconomic group. This goes beyond the sport and physical activity sector. You can see from the slide, there are a number of different ways that you will have probably seen before about how we could look at and define socioeconomics and therefore a low socioeconomic group. However, because there are so many, this could be nebulous and open to interpretation. And it does allow people to project, project preconceptions onto large diverse groups of people. I'm sure within your work, you all have your own measuring tools, but this is only the start. Sport England have been using NSSEC at a national level and an IMD at a local to identify and provide a measure of success. Our place work and the challenge from the review shows that this is a start, but it's not how we will work with the audience nor have long-term impact on activity levels. The review and our local place work has shown us that we perhaps need to think about the evidence in the round and take a more holistic approach to inactivity um, for low socioeconomic groups. We know that so many factors can impact on lives and we need to think about how we can do this, not thinking about 12 million people, but through local communities. Characteristics overlap and intersect with each other to create individuals, identities and diverse communities, all of whom have different needs and lived experiences of sport and physical activity. The system level factors, the onion diagram, the coloured one, um, combine with um, intersecting characteristics of an individual to determine the extent of to which pe different people and groups are having their needs met by the sector. This also, also influences the extent to which individual different, in different individuals feel like they have the opportunity, the capability and motivation required to participate in sport and physical activity. And that's the diagram on the right hand side, the COMB model. If we first think about the system, the external factors are highly influential on individuals' lives, and yet they're often beyond the control of the individual and beyond the control of the sport and physical activity sector. To give a few examples, recent socioeconomic changes and policy responses have disproportionately and negatively affected low socioeconomic group individuals. Life can be practically demanding, money is tight. In the age of austerity, local provision of facilities is poor, and that's especially important for individuals who often lead highly local lives. This next section seems negative, but it's food for thought within our thinking. Amongst those in poverty, just making it through is just enough of a challenge and can take all of one's attentions. Social mobility is poor, and we are acutely aware that people living in poverty is growing and not shrinking. There has been an unfortunate history of public sector investments and interventions that focus on what is wrong with the people who don't behave in the way that seems logical to policymakers, rather than focusing on what might be wrong in the communities, environments and organisations that surround those people. Sports and leisure clubs and facilities are often far too far away from individuals who love to live their lives locally and local spaces lack of, for, suffer from lack of investment and can contain prohibitive rules like no ball games. Social norms and environment are also powerful drivers of behaviour. Some social groups collectively recognise the value of physical activity, prioritise it and take part in a way that models an active lifestyle for one another, which is self-perpetuating and reinforcing. Others form their norm around other priorities and other enjoyments and behaviours and therefore seeing physical activity through choice may rarely or never occur. Low socioeconomic group individuals sense of identity comes from community. So frames of reference are local, traditional and familiar. Family structures can be very different to other socioeconomic groups. Physical activity can be discouraged for perfectly well-meaning reasons. Traditional gender roles can be passed on to children with particularly negative effects on girls and women. But this is not so of everyone. 
Some of the factors thrown at an individual by the system can impact on the individual's feelings and motivations about the opportunities provided to them. This isn't trying to look through the lens of lack, but provide some insight into these feelings. It isn't to play back to the audience, but some factors to consider to be able to tackle inequalities and to go into conversations with some empathy. This does put her in danger of grouping and other again, othering again, thus starts to demonstrate that until we actually talk and engage with an audience, we will never really know how a community is thinking and feeling. But to highlight a few and not dwell on this side, the unkindness of change can make people suspicious of change. It's safer to be nostalgic and retreat to the comfort of an imagined past with a desire to conserve rather than progress. So how can we work with these communities to help make changes that don't feel suspicious? Individuals can feel ignored, not valued, judged or stigmatised. Media is not kind to this audience, as I've already shown you. They can be portrayed as cheats, violent, bad parents, gambling, no respect, teenage mums, big TVs, takeaways, all sorts of things. So we need to think about how we can make a community and individuals feel like they are being involved in decisions and solutions for their community. But this is complicated and we can't say that every factor that I've put up there affects every individual. So how do we use this information about the audience to provide a context but not provide a blanket approach to 12 million people? It's nationally aggregated information and research. Hopefully it shows that perhaps by treating 12 million people differently, we might help to shift the dial. We need to understand what challenges that individuals have and that can help our thinking and, in, and empathy. We need to understand the lived experience. Perhaps this is better understood and answered through working in place. And I'll hand over to Warren. Thanks, Rachel, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Warren Lee. Uh, I'm a strategic lead in the local delivery director at Sports England, and I have a geographical focus in London. Um, I don't know if you can see the poster behind me, but I'm much closer to Croyd than, uh, to, to Croydon than Croyd. Uh, unfortunately, that's just a, a souvenir from a previous holiday. Um, just as an aside, really, while I live in London now, I originally grew up in the Northwest, and I would certainly have been part of that 12 million sized audience uh, growing up in a kind of an, an LSEG community, if you like, albeit I was a very happy and very active child. Um, so why am I here? I'm here to talk about people and places, uh, a document called The Story of Doing It Differently. Um, we published this back in February this year, and I'm certainly not going to be able to distill that 50 pages of rich learning, infographics, images and narrative into my 10 to 15 minute slot. But my hope is to give you just enough of a taster into the publication that it'll encourage you to read the whole document and, and delve a bit deeper. That, that's if you haven't read it already. We believe this is the best articulation of the story so far of the local delivery pilots. It shares the challenges we have faced and what we've learned along the way. We also recognize that the pilots are not unique in considering sy systemic ways of working in their places. Other sectors, local authorities and places are also considering complex challenges, whether it's around inactivity, youth violence, obesity, and other long-standing systemic, systemic issues. And many of the audience in this room, I'm sure, will be working in creative, innovative ways with your communities and places to do things differently. However, we are really confident that there will be learning from the pilot and from this document that resonates with others who are undertaking this type of approach and we hope it will spark interest in those who are considering this way of working. So I realised that um, within this audience, there'll probably be some who are very familiar with the local delivery pilots. There'll be some who know absolutely nothing about them and there'll be some in between. So I'm just going to spend 30-ish seconds giving a kind of a lightning recap on, on where I came from. Um, the journey began in 2016 and with the launch of the previous Sports England strategy toward, towards an active nation. Within that strategy, we outlined an ambition to work in a different way with places. We tried to find new ways of working together to encourage communities, particularly those facing stubborn inequalities around activity levels. And together we try and address the systemic barriers that make it difficult for people in those places to live more active lives. At the end of the process, as it says on the slide, we had 12 local pilots, 
you can see on the right hand side a, a fairly good geographical spread, albeit uh, quite a concentration on either side of the Pennines. And if you're asking why we're talking about this document here today, it's because the pilot areas do have an overrepresentation of LSEG audiences. I should also say that each pilot is unique. That includes the size and demographics of the, the, the target population they're working with, um, the nature of those audiences that they're focused within them, whether it's children in Bradford, for example, um, whole population in other areas. And the actual approach that is being taken is very different, as is the level of investment in each place. All of them differ quite significantly in terms of what they're doing. So if that's a, a very quick whistle stop kind of history tour of the local de delivery pilots, this is a bit of a kind of uh, what I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about is the story so far and what we've been learning and the people and places report. So if, uh, if the publication is an attempt to distill four years of learning into one document, uh, this slide uh, is an attempt to summarise a document onto a single page. Now, I realise that unless you've got super eyesight, you, you will have no chance of reading what's contained there, and, and nor kind of do we intend you to. So I'm just going to give you a quick flavour of some of this, and it will be available to download, and you can actually kind of print it off or, or use your Zoom functions on the screen. Um, because despite the difference that I just talked about in terms of what the pilots are doing and how they're fo focusing and responding to the challenges in their places, what, is, what there are is lots of similarities about how they're working to create change. There are core principles, behaviours and learning emerging that do appear to be consistent across all of the pilots. Um, and that's really what this document is focusing on. So just to pick a few out and just give you a few little tasters before I, I go slightly deeper into one of them. Uh, first of all, it's the box at the bottom, which you might be able to say is becoming the change that you want to see. Um, and this was a recognition, really, that it's not just about the pilots who are working differently. It's actually about Sport England needing to work differently change our approaches, change our behaviours, and move away from Sport England setting the direction to a more collaborative approach to determining investment priorities, from setting time, very strict timelines across projects to understanding that pilots need to work at different paces. Um, instead of starting with a, pr a predetermined solution, starting with conversations about what's needed in places, and instead of investing in projects and things, investing in capacity, people and learning. The other one just to draw attention to is the is the box on learning and learning is the doing at the top. And in particular, a theme that you'll see throughout the document is around, is around trust. The first line, which you won't be able to read, says progress moves at the speed of trust and the absolute centrality of establishing strong, strong relationships locally, which takes time. But what we do know is if you're to reach into the communities you want to support to become active and the system partners who are going to drive that, developing trust is absolutely key with those local communities. Another one of those bullet points in that section also talks about going where the energy is. You'll know that there are a whole host of people in the system, system partners, community organisation, clubs, charities, etc., cetera, um, who have a role to play here. And um, what the pilots have learned is while it's important to engage all elements of the system, some may be up for joining you on that journey quicker than others. And it's really important to go where the energy is, whether that's the director of public health that's really enthused about the work and offers a kind of a good way in an adult social care director who believes it's absolutely critical to keep uh, recipients of social care active, whether it's the planners, whether it's regeneration leads, wherever the energy is in that place is often a good place to start. But where I'm going to spend the bulk of the next five, five to seven minutes or so is on the red box, which is the practicalities of system change. Hopefully this is a little bit more readable in terms of some of the boxes. And again, I'm not going to talk about every single one of these. There's, there's 10 in total kind of common practicalities, but I'll just pick out a four. And I'm going to try and do that by just giving you a bit of an insight into one of the pilots, which is one of the ones I'm more familiar with, which is Southall. Southall is situated in West London. It's part of the London Borough of Ealing, for those of you that are not familiar with it. Uh, it's known as Little India and it, because it has the largest Punjabi population outside of India. So it's rich in South Asian culture and uh, I can promise you has some of the best Indian food in the capital. Population of 70,000, it's close to Heathrow, which is a major employer in the area. But it does, it does have relatively high levels of deprivation, certainly compared with the Ealing average. Um, it's also going through lots of growth, lots of housing growth, uh, lots of flatted developments, 
uh, primarily driven by crossrail, uh, which is often greater transport connectivity. So the first one I'm going to highlight is the shared purpose. Uh, and that's that's an image of some of the, the activation that's been taking place in Southall. And um, what we found across all the pilots, it's really important to understand what matters, what is the issues that are trying to be resolved in that place. Um, and, and, and generating buying for that. In Southall, there was a survey of residents right at the outset of the program that showed that 43% of Southall residents were classified as inactive. That compared with 27% across the borough, 25% nationally. This combined with the existing knowledge that there are up to 10 years disparity of life between Southall residents and their fellow Ealing residents uh, just had a kind of a galvanizing effect a recognition that things had to change. They couldn't carry on like this. The survey was an important moment um, and had that galvanizing effect with all partners kind of taking that as a kind of real step change and recognizing that they had a role to play. That helped to, find, to form some of the core values. One of them being that the vision needed to be developed and owned by Southall. This was not something that could be developed and led from the council offices based in Ealing that actually sit outside of place. It required the development of a shared understanding from all of those leaders in places, agreement to take responsibility and recognise that a change in behaviours and mindsets from them was essential if it was going to prevent local people dying younger. Lots of objectives were agreed through multi-stakeholder events and discussions with local people. And the vision was that for generations to come, people in Southall will become some of the most active and healthy in the country. I suspect if I read them out, some of the objectives that sat below that might not feel that different and that radical and that bold to some of the ones that you're familiar with in your places. But the way of approaching them and tackling them, we believe really is different and really is bold and ambitious. And that's the development of a social movement, which will help to address that. I'll talk about that shortly. So again, common through all of the 10 is the absolute critical nature the need to take time to understand the lived experience. Um, and for all 12 pilots, this goes way beyond some kind of surveys and consultations. It's ongoing discussion, co-creation with communities, a genuine curiosity and interest in working differently and understanding that if change is to happen, it has to be shaped around local circumstances, local needs. In Southall, the social movement that's developing recognises that it's only people in Southall that have the connections and networks that are needed to reach into communities and bring them together. The social movement has recruited organisers from the local community who are leading and developing five campaigns, each of which are targeting different groups of inactive residents. These local people are being provided with support, guidance and development, who are then recruiting locally inactive people to join them, to become active and to support them in, in terms of activation, listening them to understanding their individual and collective barriers, their motivations and their interests designing activities around that insight and understanding that people can engage with. Really crucially, this approach develops trust. So the people leading the work are actually rooted in the community. They're from the community. They're people like them. Already we have seen Southall residents recruited uh, who were originally recruited as inactive people on one of the campaigns are stepping up to become the organisers themselves. So they're recognising the benefit that it's given them in, in becoming more active. And they're starting to broaden uh, to, to broaden that network, to develop that social movement. Uh, some people have equated it to a pyramid scheme uh, where those who are supported to be active then subsequently support others to be active and so on. And you kind of grow the movement that way. Despite the pandemic, over 400 people have been recruited through this model and the ambition to grow that number significantly over the next 12 months. I'm just speeding up through the last few, few slides. Um, Crucial, crucially important is to understand and assist the, understand the system you're trying to change. Um, there's, there's a very simple kind of asset mapping model there of one of the particular projects within Southall around cycling. But many of the LDPs started with mapping exercises using a range of techniques and methodologies to ensure they had a full understanding of the assets in the place and the current state of play. But alongside that, there are whole Southall system uh, conversations, listening campaigns where the leaders of the project are speaking to community organisations, school leaders, uh, primary care network leaders, GPs, businesses, councillors, senior council leaders, and in, South, in Southall, very crucially, faith leaders. 
Um, the purpose of the listening cams is to listen and surface the wider stakeholders' perspectives on South Wall, the changes they thought was important, and the joint action needed to create the, the plan. This insight and learning from these conversations directly informs the work of the pilot. In Southall, there's been a lot of talk about the power dynamics, trying to understand where power currently resides, who, who, who has the ability to influence large numbers of residents, and what, that, what a shift in balancing of power in that area uh, may look like and the implications it will have on some of those leaders. And really importantly, a lot of this is underpinned by really strong tools and methodologies. There are, um, there are again, th th we've got a job to do, I think, about sharing these wider. Um, but it's based on, for example, the GANs movement building, uh, social movement building approach that's, de that's developed out of Harvard. Um, so it's about really deep um, learning um, approaches, methodologies that are being applied and, and tested and, and learning, uh, gaining from them in place. Just come to the last couple of slides. Um, really, really important as well is around distributed leadership. And again, the image on the left is of some of the social, uh, some of the organisation in South Hall. These are the leaders of the social movement who come from the place. Uh, the investment in the development of these organisations has been intensive and significant. Each of them has undertaken an, uh, an eight month programme, movement building programme based on a Harvard model, where they're doing modules throughout that period. They develop many skills such as social listening, collecting and analysing data, the use of stories, and how to encourage people to be active. They've been supported in how to run activity sessions with experienced local people who are training the trainers. I've heard from these, some of these individuals a number of stories about how, um, how their confidence has been triggered by the visible difference they see in themselves and how they're able to make a difference in the lives of people. As you can see, a lot of emphasis on fun um, and, and it can be really infectious. And, and it's kind of obvious when you see it that it's actually people in the community who care about the community and are passionate the people in there that have got the best that, that are best equipped to actually connect those inactive people um, in, into the kind of the movement and, and support them in becoming active. So just in terms of wrapping up, I'm not really going to talk to this slide, um, but what you'll see there is this is a story so far. There's a number of things in here you can kind of perhaps read later. Um, that, that attempt to kind of summarise some of the key learning uh, that, that's emerging. Um, and certainly there's much more de uh, detail and richness in the actual document itself. Where to find out more? I've talked about the document. It will be available as a link if it's not been shared already. There's information on each of the local delivery pilots on the website in the uh, guise of pen portraits. There are about four to six pages, really accessible, really good summary of what each are doing. And, it, and there's also contact details there and who you can kind of contact to find out more if their particular approach is potentially of interest. So I'm coming to the end of my time. So just say thank you, thank you for uh, listening to Rachel and I. Not sure we have how much time we have for questions, but if we don't have time.